Well, I want you to go ahead and turn your Bibles this morning to uh, 2 Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, we hadn't got to 2 Thessalonians yet, but 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, as we're continuing to look as we uh, are uh, beginning this study on 1 Thessalonians and uh, just continuing to uh, take a look at that. And so we looked at the salutations last week, and as we looked at that, uh, we saw uh, in that how the Apostle Paul uh, not only uh, greeted uh, the church uh, through himself, but uh, Paul and Silvanus and uh, Timothy, Silvanus mean uh, Silas. And so as he lo we look at that, uh, there he is, he's, uh, he's writing this letter to the church of Thessalonica, and as he's writing this letter to the church of Thessalonica, He's wanting to address some things that they have some issues with, they have some questions about, uh, particularly about the second coming of Jesus Christ, and he addresses in chapter 4 and chapter 5, as we, uh, when we get into that, we'll take an in-depth look at that. But when he greets the church, as we looked at last week, we uh, looked at the fact that he was thankful for the church, amen, he's thankful for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, every single one of us need to be thankful for the church, and really, he spent the rest of chapter 1 uh, talking about listing down all of the reasons of which he had to be thankful of the church for, amen? And, and so as we begin to look at that, you know, we ought to be able to look at the church, we ought to be able to look at our church, we ought to be able to look at the church abroad and uh, look at those things in which we can be thankful for, and those are things that we need to remind ourselves of, of why we are thankful for the church of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ, while we're thankful for Mill Creek Baptist Church, while we're thankful for the church in general, amen, but the church abroad as well and all of the wonderful things that God is doing through the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when he looks at this, uh, when we look at this, we see also in verse 1 of chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul says this, Paul uh, and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and uh, grace to you and peace. And he goes on in verse 2 and he says, We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. And I talked a little bit last week about how uh, the Apostle Paul mentioned that he is praying for the church of Thessalonica, but this this evening, or this morning rather, what I wanted to do is I just want to spend a little bit of time this morning just talking about uh, the formula that the Apostle Paul had uh, that he lays out here within this text of Scripture of prayer. Now, I want us to be careful about this. When I talk about formula for prayer, and you know, a while back I preached uh, through 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, the formula for revival, and you know, sometimes I'll use that word, but what, what I don't want us to think about is that this is some kind of a, 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 a magic potion, it's kind of some kind of magic spell. If we do A, B, C, or one, two, three, uh, then all of a sudden we're going to have God's blessings on our life, right? It, it's not intended to be that uh, whatsoever. When I'm, when I'm talking about formula, uh, th this is really uh, the, 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 the way in which the Apostle Paul addresses his prayers, and he does that in pretty much all of his epistles, that is, he talks about to the church that he's praying for these churches. He's thankful for the churches and he's praying for the churches. We find this in pretty much every single one of his epistles and we certainly find this here in the epistle to uh, the, the uh, uh, for, uh, for, to the church of Thessalonica. And so when we begin to think about this and understand, here it is, it's the way in which Paul outlines his prayer, right? And we should have a strategic plan of prayer. Every single one of us ought to have a strategic plan of prayer. Now, all of us spont uh, spontaneously pray, right? Every single one of us, we have those spontaneous times of prayer. If something happens, if we, if, if we find ourselves in a bind, if we get ourselves in trouble over something, or maybe we uh, hear that somebody else that we might know, they might be in a bind, they might be in some kind of trouble, they might be in some kind of need, whatever's going on in their life. The moment we hear about that, we, we ought to anyway begin praying for them or praying for ourselves and just bringing that before before the Lord and having those spontaneous times of prayer. Of course, the Bible does tell us to pray without ceasing, amen? And so we certainly pray without ceasing, but there's also a time when the Word of God tells us to get in that prayer closet, and as we get into that prayer closet and spend time in that prayer closet, we ought to have a strategic plan of how we're going to pray. Now, 
I don't know if everybody's like me or not, <coughs> but whether it's with my Bible study, whether it's with my devotion time, whether it's with my prayer time, I have spiritual ADD, amen? Uh, and some of you might have spiritual ADD as well. Uh, your focus, your, your, your intent, that, that's what you're there to do, but then all of a sudden your mind starts going in this direction, your mind starts going in that direction, your mind starts thinking about things. You haven't thought about those things in 20 years, but all of a sudden you're thinking about them right then and there, amen? And, and that's the devil, I believe, that is trying to come after you and get you distracted from the task at hand. And the task at hand that we're talking about this morning is praying. And so we need to have a strategic plan of prayer. And so as we have that strategic plan of prayer, I believe that's what the Apostle Paul was doing right here. And so as we look at this, first of all, we see in verse 2, he says, we give thanks to God always for you making mention of you in our prayers verse 3 constantly bearing in mind um, your work of faith and the labor of love uh, steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father and, and so as we look at this and begin to see that he, he, he doesn't just mention how he's praying or the fact that he's praying for them but he mentions how he's praying for them right and he, and he mentions the, the, the certain ways in which he's praying for them and the certain things in which he's praying for them in and so in that uh, yes he's giving thanks to the church but he's not just giving thanks to the church to them but he's giving thanks to the church before God amen he's giving thanks to the church before God and he's coming before the throne of God and he's giving thanks we give thanks to God always to God always for all of you making mention of you in our prayers so the thanks that he's giving is a part of his prayer not just being thankful for the church but being thankful before God for the church being thankful before God first of all for what God has done in the church for the fact that God has brought about the gospel of Jesus Christ the father has brought about the gospel of Jesus Christ Jesus was obedient in the fact that he went to the cross and he died on the cross and he shed his blood Jesus the son of God God in the flesh who died for us we're thankful to him amen we're thankful for him uh, for for providing the means of salvation for us and for the fact that the people heard the gospel there the church of Thessalonica they heard the gospel we talked about that a couple of weeks ago in Acts chapter 17 how they heard it and how they received it how they were saved and then how a church was formed and so that is all an act of God amen people don't just sit in their mind and say you know what I think I'm just going to go start a church he doesn't want to go to our church. I've been in Picky long enough. You've been in Picky long enough. We, we see churches kind of pop up. Somebody decide, well, we're just going to go start a church. And you know, the idea of most church planners today is they, they want to start a church because they don't want to be like the church that they grew up in or they don't want to be like the church that across the street, right? That's not a reason to start in a church. The reason to start a church is to see people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that is the only reason, amen, for people to grow and mature and grow in that, in, in, in that walk in the Lord. And so when, when we find that, uh, you know, here it is that, that, that folks are starting churches, I'm all for starting churches. God led me to start a church uh, before. And, 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 and the reality is we ought to do it because God has ordained it. God has called it. Amen? Because if he's not in, he's not going to bless it, and it's not going to sustain. It's not going to last. I praise God for the men of God back in 1909 that got together and said, you know what, this community right here, Salem community right over there on Mill Creek, uh, the, literally on Mill Creek, decided to get together and said, we need church. Amen? But it wasn't just them. It was God that did it. Amen? God that did it. And so for that reason, we come before God and we're thankful. We give thanks to God always for you making mention of you in our prayers. Who is the you? That's the church, right? And so we're thankful to God for the church and we're bringing that up to God as a petition, as, as being thankful. And as we give thanks, something that we need to understand, when we come to God in prayer, when we get back focused on prayer, right? We're back focused on prayer. You know what? Our prayer needs to start with God, and our prayer needs to end with God. 
You know what we do all too many times? All too many times we come to God in prayer and say, God, I need, God, I need, God, I need, God, I need, God, I need. Amen. Amen. Now, there's nothing wrong with coming to God on behalf of our needs or on behalf of other people's needs. In fact, the Word of God tells us to do that. Amen? That we're to do that. But what we need to understand is that prayer needs to be focused on God. Prayer does not need to be focused on the need. Amen? It needs to be focused on God. Because you know what prayer is? Prayer is an act of worship. Amen. Prayer is an act of worship. And when we come before God and we're focused upon the need and we're not focused upon the God who can provide the need, then it is not an act of worship and we make it something that it was never intended to be. And prayer needs to get back to the root of being an act of worship. And when prayer gets back to the, 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 the act of being an act of worship, then it's true prayer and it's truly going up to the very throne of God when we start when everything falls apart. Now, Tammy didn't know what I was preaching on this morning, amen, but God led her to that. And then when I was, I was, I was listening to it, I said, I don't think it could be a more perfect song than, than uh, be right before this message right now, amen. So when everything falls apart, what's the very first thing you do? You need to praise his name, amen. You need to praise his name. Because even though the world is chaotic right now, even though the world is a mess right now, everything, everything's falling apart, everything's upside down, God is still high and lifted up, sitting upon His throne. He is still King of kings. He's still Lord of lords. He's still Almighty God. He always has been. Guess what? He's always going to be. And so when we come before the throne and we put it back at the perspective that God is almighty, God, regardless of what's going on in the world right now, I give thanks unto you because you're still the God that saves. You save my old wretched soul. You save my family's soul. You're still in the business of saving. You're still saving the lost. You're still drawing people unto yourself. You're still growing the church. You're still maturing the church. You're still at work, regardless of what's going on out there. God, I'm thankful unto you. Because when Jesus gave his formula to prayer, if you will, disciples came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, how shall we pray? He didn't give them something that's just supposed to be repeated over and over again and not really mean anything. He gave them an outline, if you will. Right? Strategic plan, formula. He started with this, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What did he start with? He started with God. Amen? He started with praise. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be your name. You're holy, God. I'm coming to you first and foremost as an act of worship before I do anything else. My focus is entirely upon you amen and so when we put things in perspective as they ought to be keep our eyes focused on the things above rather than the things below then even the things below begin to look much simpler amen because he's almighty god and he is in control despite what i'm seeing with my eyes right now Despite what the news broadcasters are saying, whose job is to sell you fear so you keep watching them. Amen? Despite what the politicians are doing, despite what Putin's doing, despite what anybody's doing, God's in control. Amen? He's in control. And we come to Him, and we, before we even begin to look at all of the chaos and calamity, it doesn't mean that we're living... In denial, world's a mess, <laughs> right? We're not denying that. It's the fact. The world is an outright mess. Everywhere, the whole world is messed up right now. Everywhere you turn, everywhere you look. There's no denying that. We're not living in denial. But we're reminded of the things that we could go before God first and foremost of and give thanks to Him of the ways in which he is already moving and the ways in which he is continuing to move and the ways in which, though we haven't seen it with our eyes yet, we know that he is more than able to continue to move. Amen? 
we give thanks unto Him. And so when we look at that, it puts God first. It puts God in the center of things. Far too often we focus on the need first, we go to God before the need, not saying that the need's not important. The need is very important. And, and, and God cares about the need, and God cares about the one who is in need of the need. And God cares about you, God cares about everyone, right? But as a child of God, our focus needs to be upon Him first and foremost. But I want you to also understand what he says. It's easy to overlook this. Verse 2 says, We give thanks to God always for, you, for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. We give thanks, making mention of you in our prayers. And yes, we need to have individual prayer time, and individual prayer time is extraordinarily important. Jesus talked about having those prayer closets, right? And so we need to be in those prayer closets. We need to get in those prayer closets, have our daily individual prayer time, and that is extraordinarily important. We need to do that every single day of our life, have that individual prayer time, have that individual focus time. But friends, I want you to understand corporate prayer is also extraordinarily important. Amen? When we come together as a body of Christ. Now, the greeting, uh, though Paul was the one who wrote the letter through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he, he gave the greeting from Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. And so as he gave that greeting from the three of them, probably uh, them with the, the plurality of that, that we give thanks and uh, uh, always making mention of you in our prayers rather than the single focus upon him himself. He is mentioning uh, uh, Paul. Paul, or he's mentioned Sylvanius, which is uh, Silas, and also Timothy along with them. But you know what? When we begin to think about this, we, we, we think about church, and oftentimes we think about church saying we need a whole lot of people there. But Jesus said this. Jesus said, we're two or more gathered in my name. I'll be there. Amen? We're two or more gathered in my name. I will be there. It's what Jesus said. The Bible also says we're two or more agree upon anything. Anything, where two or more agree upon anything, it's going to be done. You know, there's power and unity when Christians get together, whether it's just the three here that Paul's referring to, or his whole ministry team, or the church in which he was at at that particular time when he was writing uh, to the church of Thessalonica, regardless of what that intent was. It probably was just intending uh, those original three uh, that were uh, mentioned there. But regardless of what it is, when, when two or more get together for the purpose of prayer, and they begin praying corporately, uh, how much much more when the whole church gets together with one mind and with one purpose and with one goal and just begins to pray and just begins to seek the face of God for whatever that need is. Now here Paul was talking about how he was praying to the church or for, for the church rather uh, um, uh, to God uh, and he was thankful to God for the church but friends it doesn't just have to be for the church it can be for anything and it could be for anyone this could be with you a mother praying for her child uh, this could be for you praying for a health issue going on in your personal life whatever it is amen doesn't matter what the need is it doesn't matter what the circumstance is the principle is all still the same right here and certainly we ought to be praying for our church and i talked about that last week every single one of us ought to be praying for our church but you know regardless of the need every single member of the body of christ all they gathered together united praying because there's power in a praying church Every single great awakening, every single great revival was birthed in a movement of prayer. That's where it started from. It wasn't started from great preachers, from great ministers. As a matter of fact, when Jonathan Edwards, when the first great awakening started, it was started, most people will say, most historians will tell you that it was started when Jonathan Edwards preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. And most people, but most of the people that were there 
recorded that because it was recorded in newspapers and we have those recordings that were you know it was a, it was a big deal and so as that broke out he stood up behind the pulpit he pulled out a manuscript and he read in a monotone voice verbatim sinners in the hand of an angry God and the power of God fell down upon them but I'm here to tell you it didn't start when he preached that sermon really read that sermon it didn't start at that time it started much prior when folks at his church were gathered together praying and seeking the face of God that God would move and guess what? He did. <laughs> Amen? When we get together and pray as a body, as a unit, as one voice towards one God, God's going to hear those prayers. And God's going to answer those prayers. Amen? Amen? So he continues on this as we think about corporate worship. You know, when we, when we understand corporate worship, only has to be two or more, right? When we understand corporate worship, we need to be in agreement with our voices lifted up. So it's not really that complicated, is it? We just need to be in obedience of doing it, living it out. I praise God for the prayer warriors that we have right here at Mill Creek Baptist Church. You know, the prayer warriors are some of the most powerful Christians that we have in the life of the church. Probably also some of the least seen and least known about Christians in the life of the church. They, they don't wear, I'm a, I'm a prayer warrior uh, badge or, or, or T-shirt. Going around telling everybody, hey, that's, that's, who, that's what God's called me to do. Usually very humble people. Now, if you've been around them long enough, you're going to know. Amen. You're going to know who they are. And you're going to know where to bring your petitions to. Amen. It's not something that they go out and broadcast, and publicize, let everybody know. Everybody knows who the pastor is. He's the guy that stands up behind the pulpit every Sunday morning. Everybody, everybody knows who the music team is. They're the ones leading the worship. But I tell you what, that prayer team is in those prayer closets day after day after day after day doing a phenomenal work for the kingdom of God. We need more of them. Amen. Everybody needs to be on that team. But he also says, and, and as we look there, he says he's making mention of you in our prayers. Making mention of you in our prayers. Now, what does that mean? First of all, let's, let's ask the question, what is prayer? Well, I've already said prayer is an act of worship, right? That's what prayer is. It's an act of worship. What is prayer? Prayer is bringing our petitions to the throne, right? We've got our, th our petitions. We've got our list. We're bringing those petitions, we're bringing that list to the throne, to the King of kings, to the Lord of lords. But what is prayer? I mean, it's the most fundamental part of prayer. What is prayer? It's having a conversation with God. Amen? Paul says, I'm making mention of you to God. It's having a conversation with God, Right? And so when you begin to think about that, when you begin to understand that here it is, that we have the great privilege, we have the great honor to have a conversation with God. You know, when somebody says, would you please pray for me? What they're really saying, hey, when you, when, when you go before the throne today, would you just put in a good word for me? <laughs> Amen? Just put in a good word for me. When you go before the throne today, just, just mention me before the king. Amen? Now, certainly we ought to be praying for ourselves, and absolutely we ought to be praying for one another. And I praise God that, you know, when, when, when I got sick, I just had a phenomenal amount of people uh, uh, just start coming up to me and say, Brother Rusty, I'm praying for you. Brother Rusty, I'm praying for you. And I had no doubt that they were. 
I can't say with confidence everybody that's ever told me that they were praying for me truly did pray for me, but I know some of them were. Amen? I still have folks that tell me, and some of you tell me, Brother Russ, I'm praying for you, and I praise God for that. You're putting in a word for me before the king in your conversation with the king. That's a holy and it's a reverent conversation. Very special, very privileged conversation. Amen? But that's exactly what it is. Conversation with the king. So as we make mention, you know, I believe that we need to have a prayer list. I, I need to, uh, there again, I've got spiritual ADD. Amen? My mind is, just starts bouncing off the wall, going every kind of direction. And so we need that prayer list, and we need to keep that prayer list in front of us. We need to write down those prayer needs, and as we write down those prayer needs, and that mind starts bouncing one way and the other way and all kinds of different ways, we go back to the list and say, Father, forgive me, I've gotten distracted, but let's get back on task here. These are the things that I'm coming to you. Making mention of the church or making mention of my brother's needs, making mention of my sister's needs, making mention of my child's needs, making mention of whatever that needs that, that happen to be here before us on this day. And you know, as we think about this, here it is, he says in the next verse, in verse 3, he says, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness and hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of God and Father. So again, Paul mentions that he's thankful for the church, and what is he thankful to the church for? He's thankful, he, he, he spends the rest of this chapter talking about those things that he, he's thankful for them uh, for, but he, he says he, he's thankful for uh, the work of uh, a faith that they have. He's thankful for the labor of love that they have, and he's thankful for the steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ that they have. So, so what is it? It, it, it is faith, love, and hope. Amen? He just breaks it all down in the rest of the chapter there. We're going to talk about that in later dates and examine that. But he says, I'm bearing in mind. I'm looking around and I'm seeing the good stuff that's going on. As I'm looking around, I'm seeing the good stuff. Remember, he had a report from Timothy. Timothy came back, gave him that good report. This is what's going on over there at the church of Thessalonica. He couldn't go over there himself, so Timothy comes back. He gives them this good report. There's faith, there's hope, there's love. There's going on over there in the church. And so he's bearing this in mind and he's keeping thought of it. He's keeping track of it. As he hears these good things going on in the church, he goes before God and he gives thanks. Amen? Now, we can bear in mind a lot of things. We can bear in mind all kinds of things, and some of those things aren't good. You know, sometimes as we begin to focus on those things that aren't good, oh, you know, that old... That old so and so, he's supposed to do that. He's supposed to do do this, and you know he 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 said that to me, and she said this to me, and you know they all oh, they don't really care about me, and all this negativity. And the more we think negatively, then then the more that's just going to begin to pile up on us, and we get focused and distracted on all of those negative things. And you know, again, not that we're living in denial. But it's that Satan uses that as a tactic to get you to look at all the bad and forget about all the good. Amen? And when you're looking at all of the bad and you're not looking at all the good, it's like a, a, a married couple. They come up to me and say, Brother Rusty, we, we, we need some marriage counsel. I can't stand this woman anymore. I can't stand this man anymore. All right, well, let's start here. Let's get back to the good days. Why did you say you wanted to marry him in the first place? Why did you say you wanted to marry her in the first place? Let's get back to the good stuff. Amen? Remember the days of the googly eyes. Remember the days of the fluttering hearts. Remember the days of the goosebumps and all that. Let's get back to that. And then realize that all that negativity that you've been focusing on all this time, you were making a mountain out of a molehill. 
Amen? Then life of a church. Now, now Thessalonica was not a perfect church. The church of Thessalonians was not a perfect church. In fact, Paul had to address some things with them. We're going to talk about some of those things. They weren't a perfect church. Heard somebody say, if you ever find a perfect church, don't ever join it, because you're going to join it, and you're going to mess it all up. <laughs> Amen? No such thing as a perfect church. And we can get focused on the imperfections all day long, but realize we're all imperfect. Sorry, even you. Amen? All of us. But what we have to focus on, and this isn't positive thinking that we're talking about. We don't neglect the bad things. They need to be dealt with. Right? They need to be dealt with. In a Christ-like, loving way, they need to be dealt with. Remember, let's remember what God has done. Let's remember what God is doing. Let's remember the potential of what God still can do. Amen? But he's bearing in mind the good things, and he mentions those good things, the faith, hope, and love that, that's going on within the church, and he's coming before the throne, and he's being thankful to them. But this is what he also says right here, constantly, verse 3, constantly bearing in mind your work. Constantly bearing in mind your work. A faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of God our Father. He also says in verse 2, we give thanks to God always. For you. So that word always and constantly. You know, prayer is about steadfastness. Amen? It is about perseverance. It is about pressing through. See, we're not going and throwing our change into a wishing well and saying it's a done deal. Amen? No, this is about relationship. So, well, why can't it be a good uh, done deal? And sometimes it is. Sometimes you pray about something one time and God does it, it happens. It's done. But more times than not, it is all about pressing through and persevering, being steadfast. Why is that? Could have a whole lot more to do with us. Not that we're lacking in faith, but God wants to grow our faith. Amen? God wants to mature us. God wants to build our relationship with Him. Allowing us to come before Him time after time after time after time in those times of prayer. Amen? Now certainly God can give to us anything at any moment, and He can do Anything he wants to do, he's almighty God. But I believe sometimes he just wants to build our prayer life up. Build our walk up. Now, we don't always have the answers of why God does the things that he does and why God doesn't do some of the things that we would like him do, to do, but thank God we're not God. <laughs> but we do know that he knows best. Jesus gave this parable in Luke chapter 11, Beginning in verse 5, he said this. He said, Luke chapter 11, verse 5, he says, Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside, he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Tell you, even though that he will not get up and give him anything because he's a friend, yet because of his perseverance, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. You know, I kind of find a little bit of humor in that parable that Jesus gives right there. Friends coming to the other friend's house late at night. 
Kids are tucked up in bed. They're getting in bed, get a knock at the door. Now, who is that this late at night coming to my house? Don't they know I get up early in the morning? <laughs> Amen. Well, it's a friend in need. Well, what do you need? Need a loaf of bread. It's too late at night to be coming to my house asking me for a loaf of bread. Go away. Come back another time. But they don't go away. They just keep on knocking and keep on knocking and keep on knocking. Eventually, just to get them to go away, here's the loaf of bread. <laughs> get on out of here. I'm going to bed. Amen. Jesus right after that said, if you ask, it's going to be given to you. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door is going to be open. Then he also said, <laughs> the son asked his father for a loaf of bread. He won't give him a Snake, will he? No, of course not. How silly is that? How much more that your heavenly Father, who loves you, give to you? Amen? He loves you. Friends, we need to be prayer warriors. Everyone else. As the praise team comes up this morning, as you stand, you're here today and you've got prayer needs. You've got needs that are on your heart, on your mind, or you know others that stand in need. But you're not praying. Brother Tiger comes up to me and says, hey, Brother Rusty, I've got a need. I've, I've got this, this, that, and other going on in my life. Would you pray for me? Absolutely, I sure will. Go on about my business. And I don't. Now, we all get absent-minded from time to time. You know what we ought to do? We ought to stop right then and there and say, well, let's go ahead and pray right now. Amen, let's go ahead and pray right now. Because we all slips. That Brother Keith said he's getting old. He can't remember his name anymore. Amen. Maybe not exactly what he said, but we understand it. But friends, we need to be about the business of prayer. We have not. Why? Because we ask not. Start asking. Let's utilize that time by spending time with the Father. Amen? Right now, if you've got prayer needs, this altar is open. You come as the Lord so leads. If God stirs in your heart. Would you lift up those prayers? Yeah, you could use that chair right there as an altar as well. Let's pray. Let's seek the face of God. Let's pray for revival within our nation. Oh, how desperately we need it. Let's seek God. Let's pray right now. I'll be glad to pray with you. You come. God to lead. The only way your prayers are going to reach the throne, my friends, is if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
If you're not saved today, if you've never trusted in Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, then your, your prayers aren't getting anywhere. Once you're saved, you can boldly approach the throne of grace. That's a promise to us in the Word of God, but you have to be saved first. So today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you come? Just put your faith in Him. Put your trust in Him today, and He'll save you. He loves you, and He wants to save you. Would you come as God so leads?